Happy hour, everybody. Cheers. We haven't done a happy hour in a long time. I know. I've missed that. And yes, wine in a mason jar. <laughs> what else would you expect from a knucklehead, right? From a redneck. From a redneck. Wine That's in a mason something jar. something a redneck would do. Welcome to our home, everybody. Yep. Welcome to happy hour. Yeah, we haven't I'll, done one of these for a while. Sit, yeah, we can all sit around and have a drink together. Yeah, we do have some things we want to talk about. What? Something that's going to be controversial, but I think it needs to get out here. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, yeah, controversial can be. Oh, where to start first? Well, why don't we start with your happy experience? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Now, uh, paydays <laughs> for us is on Mondays, and I went last Monday to pick up Mike's check, and uh, nobody was around, but as I was getting in the car, this van pulls up behind me and blocks me in, and I'm like, oh, okay, who are these guys? And the minute <laughs> they got out of the van, I knew. Because give you three guesses to who they were, and the first two don't count. <laughs> yeah, let's see. He's in a suit and tie, and his young daughter is in a dress, and they have tablets and the silver shank in their hands and memorial invitations. We got ours. Yeah. <laughs> and so I accepted the it, <coughs> memorial invitation, and I said, oh, and I'll take anything else you've got. And uh, I said, my mother-in-law is a Jehovah Witness, which is not a lie. She is. And they, I said, oh, I take the watch, hire, and awake, so I'll take those. And he's like, well, we don't give out the watch, hire, and awakes anymore. We give out one at a time now. So they give you one thin awake this month, and if I want the watchtower, I have to wait until next month. Oh, or go to JW.org, which, you know, we already frequently do. <laughs> yeah. But it was interesting because, you know, I'm looking at the memorial invitation, and I says, oh, I says, um, how come you guys aren't celebrating memorial on Nice and 14 this year? And he's like, oh, yeah, we do. You know, that's when we celebrate. I says, not this year. And he's like, yeah, we, we always celebrate on Nice and 14th. I said, not this year. I said, nice and 14th isn't until April. And I said, the <laughs> Jewish Passover is April. You know, they would know what month nice and was and their Passover and all that. And he says, and I see just this blank stare and he looks towards the van. Well, then all of a sudden here comes the window being rolled down and it's it's got to be an elder. I swear I can smell them a mile away. And, you know, he's like, you know, Nice and 14, and, I, and he's trying to explain, you know, oh, well, it's the first full moon after the spring equinox. And I says, right, because this year you're celebrating it Mar in March, which is the month of Adar, or Adar, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. And um, anyway, um, he looked a little puzzled, you know, he's like, oh, well, I'm going to have to check on that. And uh, so, of course, then he's trying to explain why the lunar years and, you know, all that. So then they change the subject. And I says, oh, and I see you guys are getting new light. And he's like, what? Excuse me? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. And he says, do you go to JW.org? I says, oh, yeah, all the time. I said, like I said, you know, I've got family that are witnesses. And, oh, yeah, I keep up to date on stuff. You know, that should have been their first clue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not only are they liars, they're clueless, huh? <laughs> yeah. So he's like, new light, I don't understand. And I said, well, in the June uh, Watchtower on the study article and the questions from readers, you've got new light about the writer's inkhorn. You know, now it's being changed to being Jesus Christ instead of the 144,000. He's like, oh, well, I don't, I don't know anything about that. And he turns and he looks at the older guy in the van again, and he's like, oh, yeah, I've seen it, you know. We just have to update, you know. Shrug it off. Yeah, you know, no no big deal, you know. They just get new light and new understanding and stuff. And, but isn't uh, that the same understanding that Christendom has always had? Yeah. yeah. Go, go figure, you know. <laughs> now, this is the funny part, because I asked them if they had seen what was going on in Rio Rancho Kingdom Hall. And uh, crickets. <laughs> and then the younger guy says, no, I haven't. And I said, it was on the news. 
you know, last year about um, you guys building a Keenum Hall and blocking a poor man in a wheelchair. You Since know. this is happy hour, have most of you already figured out where this is going? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't take a rocket scientist. No, no. But believe me, you people are way smarter than the Jehovah's Witnesses on this one. Yeah. And uh, the younger one had not, but the elder in the van says, yes, I was part of building that one. And I'm like, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. I said, oh, really? And uh, he says, yeah, that was really sad, but nothing could be done about that. And I said, oh, really? And uh, I said, well, the news report, you know, the Muras said that they were lied to, that there was a handshake and an agreement that you would not block their view. And he says, well, there's some things on the news that you wouldn't see, you know, and um, I can't talk about because of some legal issues. <laughs> legal issues, yeah, right. And I says, well, I happen to know a little bit more than what was on the news, and, um, you know, I think it is, you know, really horrible that, you know, this happened and stuff, and I was talking a little bit, and he says, well, you know, there's a lot more going on that you don't know, and I just looked at him, I'm tired of his condescending attitude, and I says, well, let me tell you, after the news report we heard last year, we contacted the Mira family, I said, have you been to introduce yourself to the Mira family and talk to them and got their side of the story? Oh, no, no, you know, I can't talk about it, because there might be legal entanglements. <laughs> and I says, well, we've become friends with the Mira family. In fact, we were just up there this past weekend. <laughs> and I said, if you were to go get their side of the story, you know, well, then suddenly he interrupts and he says, oh, well, you have to understand, the city told us we had to put it there, you know, but that's all I can say about that. And I says, well, let me share with you, we called the city. And I have it on recording that they said they don't tell anybody where to put their buildings. That you guys decided where to put that. <laughs> oh, I swear the blood drained from his face. He went white as a sheet. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, well, you know, we're going to have to continue on our work because we got to get these memorial invitations out, you know, to everybody in the territory. So I turned to the young guy. I told him where we lived. And I says, you come see us anytime. And I says, please, just take your phone there and just go to YouTube and just search Rio Rancho Kingdom Hall. And I says, you will see both sides, you know. Yep. And I says, you only know one side. I said, you will see the Mira side. And I said, it's really disturbing. And I says, please, you know, go look at that. And I says, you are welcome at our house anytime. <laughs> yeah, so, so we're waiting. <laughs> Hopefully. We're, we're waiting, but we're not holding our breath. <laughs> yeah, I know. And another funny story happened this week, too, is a friend of ours was in a restaurant, and some friends of his from the congregation, you know, came in, and they're talking and stuff, and he brought up the yearbook. And uh, the brother, of course, he's like, oh, yeah, you know, isn't it wonderful? You know, we are the fastest growing and we're growing faster. You know, Jehovah is really speeding up the work. And he says, you really need to come back to the kingdom hall. We really could use their help, your help. You know, the work is just speeding up so much. We just can't keep up. So then our friend, he's like, well, when you look at the yearbook. Now, I don't know if you remember Parker had actually done a video, the Faithful yeah. Slave recently put these two beside each other and went through a couple of the numbers, which which was brilliant. And it's just funny how this worked out that our friend did not see um, the Faithful Slave's video, but he had already done this comparison himself. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting because our friend brought out to the witness couple, he says, well, when you look at those peak numbers that, you know, you're so proud of, you know, 8.2 million and something, he says, have you noticed those peak numbers? There is 18,560 less from last year. Good morning, everybody. I have to break in here for just a minute because I actually said it backwards. Um, so I just wanted to make a correction here. The 2016 yearbook has um, 18,560 more on their peak publishers. 
but what I meant was that when you claim to have 260,000 baptized and they should all be publishers, then wouldn't that peak publishers go up? you know, tremendously. So that's the point I was trying to make. And so back to happy hour. And he said, the brother looked a little upset and didn't know how to answer that. And he says, here's something else. Witnesses have spent 1.9 billion hours preaching. And he says, and yet the increase has gone down one to 1.5%. You yeah. know, because it was 2.2 .2 the previous year. So he says, your numbers are going down. You know, but yet the partakers are going up. He says, can you explain that? And oh my goodness, that brother got so mad that he walked out of the restaurant and left his wife there alone. You know, and of course she was really nice. and Yeah. You know. But it, it just goes to show that these people, they're, they're even afraid to examine their own numbers. Uh, they're 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 really afraid that they're gonna get the finger pointed at them because here they are saying, "Oh, we need you. The growth is tremendous. You know, Jehovah is accelerating the the preaching work is speeding up." But yet the numbers tell a very different story. For instance, let's take a look at these numbers in the 2015 year book. Actually, now let me get these right. I'm. I, it's confusing for me, so I'm just going to go with what's in front of me. I have the 2015 grand totals and the 2014 grand totals. Which would make the 2014 grand totals the 2015 year book, and then the 2015 grand totals is the 2016 year book. Right. <laughs> but what I want to get at is that the number of baptized in, 20, in the 2014 year book, Watchtower... Yeah, Watchtower reported 275,581 baptized. The 2015 grand totals, which would be in the 2016 yearbook, have 260,273 baptized. That's a difference, okay, of 15,578 less. Yeah. So... You're in one year you hit two hundred and sixty thousand, and the other year you drop down. Uh, excuse me, two hundred and seventy-five thousand. In the other year, you drop down to two hundred and sixty thousand being baptized. So if this grandiose Jehovah is <laughs> speeding up the works to the point to where let's got to get in front of the camera and say, oh, you know, we need thousands of kingdom halls, not not uh, sometime in the future, but right now. Um, the numbers just do not add up at all. So, Jehovah's Witnesses, when are you going to get out of this cycle of, oh, we're the fastest growing religion, Jehovah's speeding up the work? We get, it, the numbers tell a different story. In any legitimate business, looking at numbers as a perspective, as a uh, perspective indication of growth, these numbers would show that you're declining and not growing. And there would have to be some serious steps to be taken. To, I don't know, maybe uh, cut funding somewhere. Maybe stop the, you know, the, the growth of the Bethel facilities or, you know, Kingdom Hall projects. I mean, but that's what's happening, isn't it? Let's, uh, let's yeah. uh, toast to that. <laughs> the numbers don't lie, JWs, but your organization does. Yeah, exactly. So, I just wanted to mention here in this uh, number one 2016 Awake that I got from, you know, the elders or from the witnesses on page seven. What do you know about Jehovah's Witnesses? <laughs> and they're there with their little cart. Well, there's a little quiz here that you can take, true or false. Jehovah's Witnesses are Christians. True! <laughs> Obviously true. Yeah, then ask if they're creationists, if they believe in doctors. <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses accept the entire Bible. True. Yeah. Absolutely true. Jehovah's Witnesses use only their own Bible translation. Absolutely true. <laughs> they say false. Well, no, yeah, right. <laughs> Come on. Come on. I want a Jehovah Witness to join us in one of these happy hours. Hell, we'll even Skype the happy hour, and I want to challenge you right there. And I'm going to show you something different. 
Jehovah's Witnesses change their Bible to fit their beliefs. Absolutely. This is what False. I'm saying. Oh, I'm wrong again? God, can I get a witness? Please. We have discovered that our belief... When we have discovered that our beliefs were not completely in line with the Bible, we have adjusted our understanding False. long before we started producing the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures in 1950. But false. That's absolutely false. Do they say that's true? Well, they say that they changed their Bible to fit their beliefs as false. But we know it's true. We know it's true because <laughs> Watchtower knows for a fact that the you know the so-called divine name Jehovah is, is an invention of a Catholic monk, but yet that name Jehovah still appears in their Bible to fit the name of their God. It does. It, it don't work no more at Watchtower. Oh, you'll love this one. Mikey's gonna get riled. Jehovah's Witnesses shun community involvement. No, no, they are they are heartless. No, false. No. I'm good. <laughs> no. They they are highly involved in the community because they're the only ones on a community level that go from door to door and preach the good news of Zionism. Oh no, uh, no, excuse me, uh, the good news of the kingdom. Uh, I'm in the process. Well, you're right. I'm in you're the right. process of reading a book, and um, you know, Zionism is stuck in my head. Well, you're right. <laughs> There's a reason for that. <laughs> Our ministry benefits many in the community. We have helped many people to overcome harm harmful addictions such as the abuse of drugs and alcohol. Our literacy classes help thousands around the world to learn to read and write. We also help when disaster strikes by providing practical relief assistance to both witnesses and non-witnesses. But I have a question. How come the community of Jehovah's Witnesses in Rio Rancho didn't pressure the elders to move that kingdom all 30 frickin' feet so they could save the mirror's view? <laughs> now, come on! <laughs> well, it, it's just like in the video we just uploaded Jeez. Josh's Bible study, you know, number two, the second one. And that brother actually tells him, the, oh, well, like if a roof, a neighbor needs a new roof, we'll just go over there, you he know, and put it. a new roof on for him. Wow. Yeah, but they sure as heck can't, you know, move their kingdom hall 30 feet, you know, to protect someone's view. Oh, good Lord. Oh, you'll love this one. Jehovah's Witnesses look down on people of other religions. Absolutely. False. No, I, I <laughs> beg to differ. I bet, again, can I get a witness? I want to debate a Jehovah Witness over this article. <laughs> and make sure you bring your entire library of bomb. Oh, wait a minute. You got rid of them, didn't you? Because now you have your CD-ROMs that only go to 2000 what? 2000 something? Oh, and you'll love this. Because after they say faults, you know, that they respect everyone and all this, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Rutherford didn't. It says, um... Nor do we campaign to have laws passed that would impose our moral and religious convictions on the community. Instead, we extend to others the same tolerance that we appreciate receiving from them. But yet they won't change the child abuse policy to get in line with laws of the land. Yeah, exactly, these guys. Well, you know, Watchtowers wow. bragged on how they went to the Supreme Court to get laws changed to secure their religious freedom to go from door to door preaching Zionism. I mean, preaching the good news of the kingdom. <laughs> so I want to thank the person, um, I believe it was a viewer or friend, I'm sorry, I forgot to write down a post-it note who has sent me this. Did that train leave the station? Yeah, it left <laughs> United in Worship. It's been hey, a long week. I know the feeling. <laughs> it's been a long week. So in the United in Worship book, page 157, now, it's interesting because they're talking about blood, but I wanted to share this. It's at the bottom of the seventh paragraph. For persons who truly want to please God, the message conveyed by the command to abstain from blood is clear. So, it's interesting because now it's been changed to fractions. Fractions. But when you go back to page 155, paragraph 4, the scriptures show that if we are part of any organization that is blood guilty before God, we must sever our ties with it if we do not want to share in its sins. And they give Revelation 18, 4 and 24, and then Micah 4, 3. Such 
action deserves urgent attention. Do you hear that, Jehovah's Witnesses? So, you know, if your organization is now blood guilty by changing it, changing their and doctrine. all those people that died, you know, for refusing blood, that fractions probably could have saved their life. Yeah. Well, that's that's one of the things I want to get into about this Zionism that I'm now reading in this book. Um, but before we get into that, didn't you want to tell one more story? You know, because we all heard the secretly recorded video and that elder said um, something about, you know, we don't, we don't have hard and fast rules. We don't rules. have hard and fast rules. <laughs> yeah, we almost forgot about this one. This yeah. happened this week also. And this is an interesting story because it involves... You know, um, our son-in-law James and our daughter Shyla. Yeah. This was quite quite interesting because one of the comments that came back during this exchange of words. Well, you're going to hear it. <laughs> I don't want to give it away. Well, what happened is, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, James has been shunned by his brother, who lives just a few miles from them, for almost exactly a year now, and. Uh, out of the blue, he gets this text. Um, his brother's name is Chris. So he gets this text, and he's like, James, can you please help me? He says, I was just stopped, and my car has a... Re I have 48 hours or something like that to fix my car, or they are going to impound it. It has something to do with the struts, and I don't know exactly. Um, and James... It, who is a mechanic, he says, okay, you know, I've got the parts you need, the struts, and um, he says, you know, I'll help you. And at that point, you know, I was asked if I could drive all the way into Albuquerque with these parts, and Shyla's like, no, you're not, you know, because she knows how busy I am, and, you know. Because Shyla has a better idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she came up with the idea, um, she says, James, Contact your brother and tell him that you would like for him to ride out to, you know, my parents' house and to get the parts and then you will help him. Because she's thinking that is an hour and a half both ways. So that's three hours alone in the car with his brother to talk to him. Yep. Okay, so this is the text he gets back. Well, James says, my in-laws won't be able to bring them in town, but you and I can go out and get them. So then Chris says, hmm, I'll let you know if I can do that. Might just have to have a flatbed loaded up and take it to his friend's house. James says, I want to know if we'll be able to talk even after this, Chris, because I just don't know. Well, then Chris writes back and... Um, now, remember the other brother that, that was studying with Josh says, we don't have hard and fast rules. Yeah. Yeah, so James is wanting to know if he can still, you know, talk with his brother and stuff. And I don't have the screenshot for that one after that. Um, but James was basically saying, so you just want me to help you and then you're going to go back to shunning me. Well, then um, Chris comes back and says, well, helping someone in desperate need and then conducting business like fixing my car... Um, isn't against the rules. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how that word flew or flowed right out of his mouth. Helping you in conduct, or how you helping me in conducting business is not against the rules. And yet we all heard that JW, that Bible study, said we don't have hard and fast rules. But yet I, witnesses will call it rules when, okay, I no. need something, so I'm going to quit shunning you for right now temporarily until yeah. I get what I, I need. Until I get what I need. And then I'm going to go back to shunning you. Oh, I was just oh, I was mad too because it shows the hypocrisy and it also shows that that JW conducting that Bible study, they're, they're all liars because you can't convince me on any other planet in this solar system that... And a JW, like this brother conducting this study, is not aware of the hard and fast rules. You know, we did a video on it, but this is why I say that they're, that they're prolific liars. They make a living out of deceiving and lying to people. And whether this guy is doing it consciously or not, it doesn't matter because 
it is implanted as part of the mind control of the cult in their subconscious. They don't think twice to tell somebody who's unaware that there are no hard and fast rules, but yet here comes James's brother, Chris. Well, you helping me in this dire situation is not against the rules. Yeah. It, I mean, it just blows it right out of the water. Okay, so we've been waiting for this. Now, we know this is a controversial subject, um, so we really aren't going to give our opinion one way or the other whether we believe it is true or not. But it might answer some questions for some. Yeah, and because we all know that we have been wanting some definite answers as, you know, Watchtower's connections with Freemasonry. Yeah. And, you know, there just hasn't been the absolute 100% proof. But, and I'm not saying we have it now, but this is something that I haven't seen anywhere but, that anybody's brought up. Yeah, but it is something to think about. And there know. might be some credibility behind it, but before yeah. I get into it, you know, I am... Go ahead. I was just going to say, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the link to these two websites down below in the description. And, you know, you can go look at this information. And then it's from yeah. this book. It's from the book, Bloody Zion by um, Edward Hendry. Hendry. It has a copyright date of 2012, so it's very current information, and it's very, very well resourced. He this, has pages and pages of references. Yeah, this guy does not make a statement without referencing a source of it. But um, what I want to do is I want to read... Um, and I really don't, basically, it's Bloody Zion refuting the Jewish fables that sustain Israel's war against God and man. Now, like Kim and I said, we know this is a controversial subject. It'll probably upset some. But there's something in here that I think maybe we need to bring out as a community of ex-Jehovah's Witnesses with questions regarding Watchtower's connections with Freemasons. But before I get into that, I want to... I want to read the scripture that he starts off with in now, this book. The guy that wrote this is actually a lawyer, a lawyer and a Christian writer. Yeah. And really what he's doing with, with the scriptures that he's referring in the book, he's, he's looking at them from a lawyer's perspective. And we all know that Paul, before he was converted, was a lawyer. And... There was a lot of things that Paul was referring to in his uh, using the Old Testament from a legal standpoint. So, legalese. Legalese, yeah. <laughs> but I want to read the scripture because it really has a lot to do with Zionism. And there's a lot of other terms he used in there that I'm just now getting familiar with. Things that I've never really heard, you know, in all the years as a JW. Because I do want to point out that all of us know that when Russell started printing up his magazine, you know, the Watchtower, it was called Zion's, Zion's Watchtower. Watchtower. And many believe that he was a Zionist, Zionist, especially when you get into the pyramids, you know, and all of and that. And also one of the other terms that's used with these religions like this is Golden Age. And millennial we all know Dawn. Millennial <laughs> Dawn. And we all know... That watchtower at one time or another has used these names like before the awake was the awake it was called the golden age. So there are some very word connections there. But going to that scripture in Titus chapter 1 and I'm going to read this from the complete Jewish Bible. <coughs> and I found this set of scriptures very interesting. We'll start at verse 10. He says, for there are many, especially of the circumcision faction. Now, we all know that there was a 20-year war of words um, against the Jew, but between the Jews and the Gentiles, the circumcised Jews thought that in order to be saved, the, Jew, the Gentiles had to be circumcision. So, when Paul here is speaking about, especially from the circumcised, from the circumcision faction, He's referring to those Jews with that mindset. Okay, uh, from the circumcision faction who are rebellious, who delude people's minds with, his, with their worthless and misleading talk. 
they must be silenced. Well, let's just stop there for a second. We all know that when watched, every time Watchtower flip-flops a doctrine, just say the one they're going to flip-flop now or change their new light. You know, before Watchtower believed it was 144,000 that went around and putting the symbolic mark in the forehead, and now they're saying it's Jesus Christ. Is that not worthless talk now? Isn't that, it, it's absolutely misleading, and it's absolutely worthless. So, there appears to be this infiltration of Judaism into these cults. They must be silenced because they are upsetting entire households by teaching what they have no business teaching and doing it for the sake of dishonest gain. Even one of the Cretans' own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars. Well, we can just put Jehovah's Witnesses are always liars. Evil brutes, lazy gluttons, and it's true. For this reason, uh, you must be severe when you rebuke those who had followed this false teaching. And that's what we do. That's what we do. <laughs> and so they, uh, so that they will come to be sound in their trust and no longer pay attention to Judaistic myths or to the commands of people who reject the truth. Now, I just want to add my two cents right here because the New World Translation is definitely written different than this. But remember, this, this guy is a Jewish Christian. Okay? He was raised a Jew. He converted to Christianity. And in his translation of the Bible, and no longer pay attention to Judaistic myths. Um, this whole blood issue that Watchtower surrenders, uh, surrenders, surrounds all of their blood issue around is Acts 15. They're enforcing what Paul is condemning as a Judaistic myth. It's a myth. Because again, Watchtower, like those Jews over the circumcision issue, believes that if you take a blood transfusion, you lose your means of salvation. And or if you do not attach yourself to the Watchtown Bible Tract Society, you lose your means of salvation. And that's what all this was from. It, what it's all stemming from, and we must remember that even Paul wrote that there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. In the Lord, we're all one. So I thought that these were very interesting, that we must, we like Paul commands, we must silence them. Well, in this particular book, there's two things I want to refer to. Now, there's a there's a section in here that Senator McCarthy, and I, you know, you can Google Senator McCarthy. You can see. Well, it will be in the website that yeah, I'm going to put you, the link to. You down will below. see who he was, and when he started doing what he was, what this book is bringing out, he mysteriously died at the Bethesda Naval Hospital for something he should not have died from. Yeah. Yeah, Beth, yeah, Beth, Beth, Beth Seda. Beth, yeah, well, we'll argue that later, dear. <laughs> but anyhow, you know, the man appeared to be silenced for what he was about to bring out. But he, there's, there, there was a book written. It's called, um, just let me make sure. Legions of Satan? Legions of Satan. No, I thought, well, give me just a second here. I thought there was the name of another book. Well, whatever the book was, the author of this book right here, Bloody Zion, made a concentrated effort to locate that book. And he could not locate it. But the quotes that he has here actually appear on the website that I think you're going to give them the link to. And some of it has to do with the American Revolutionary War. Um, the book made claims, makes claims that Washington, that Cornwallis, General Cornwallis, yeah, okay, it is, yeah, the right. Legions of Satan printed in uh, 18, 1781, and um, that's the book that he could not locate, and he's not sure if the book never really existed or if 
Somebody went to great lengths to make it disappear. But um, getting back to the George, uh, George Washington and Cornwallis surrender, we all know historically that didn't happen. Cornwallis sent one of his subordinates and surrendered the sword to George Washington. But there's something that was interesting, and this author explains, Cornwallis well knew that his military defeat was only the beginning of world catastrophe that would be universal and that uh, unrest would continue until mind control could be accomplished through false religion. What he predicted has come to pass. And we see that in Watchtower. We see that in all these cults. We, we, we see it. And it was, it's very insightful what Cornwallis was leading to. A brief sketch of American religious history. And, uh, and we have seen masonry. Yeah, thank you. We have seen masonry infused into every church in America with their veiled phallic religion. <laughs> Now, if Cornwallis was really saying that type of stuff, man, he was really, he was a really informed general. Um, because when you look at Watchtower's mind control over its people, when you look at the phallic symbols in all their literature, and, you know, everybody knows that we've done um, a huge amount of study and research into the um, subliminal images that appear in the Watchtower literature, the penis in the back of the songbook. It's interesting that Cornwallis was talked about saying these things, but what we're all waiting for. On page 192. Page 192. Drum roll. Now, this is the second time that he mentioned this in this book. So he's saying of Senator McCarthy. Senator McCarthy gave this talk that when he was talking about Cornwallis and George Washington, this is. You know, this is several pages of this speech about how the influence of the Masons were going to take over the world. And this is what he says. Now, this is not part of the talk. This is just his, um, his um, words after he... Um, Commentary after comment he quotes. Thank you. That's the word. He says, because he's saying, recall that Senator McCarthy stated that Darby and the Plymouth Brethren brought a Jewish Christianity to America. And he has a reference. It's reference number 376. He explained that Joseph Franklin Rutherford, 1869 to 1842, 1942. Uh, 1942, and Charles Taze Russell, 1852 to 1916, were Freemasons, and their Masonic religion was the source of the Judaism that is the foundation of the divine kingdom theology of the Jehovah's Witness cult. Now, he also went on to reveal that Joseph Smith was the founder of the Mormon church, was a Freemason. And it the, is interesting the Mormons admit that. They the, will admit that. They, they will admit that. They don't have a problem with that. Um, but I find it very interesting that a U.S. Senator that's in the process of exposing the Freemasonry Jewish connection to occultism was mysteriously murdered. And we also saw that again in our lifetimes because he quotes from a speech that um, J.F. Kennedy gave. And J.F. Kennedy was on the same track, making these connections between Freemasons, Judaism, occultism, and secret societies, and where they were all stemming from. And a lot of it, as Paul says here, was stemming from Judaistic myths. Um, and we all know how quickly John F. Kennedy was silenced. So... We don't want to be controversial. We're not going to discuss this on the YouTube. Um, there's the information. There's 
there's the book, Bloody Zion. Um, I do have to question and ask, what did Senator McCarthy know about Charles Taze Russell's, Charles Taze Russell and Joseph right. Rutherford that he made a public statement that they were Freemasons? I'd like to know what he knew, but unfortunately, he was because you think a senator, you know, a senator would have you know access to information. Yeah. Or, you know, that we just don't have available right now. So, like we said, you know, we're not saying this is fact, you know, 100% sure and all that. You know, just take it for what it is. Take it for what it is. It for what it is. Um, it's, it, but it's, it's very interesting. If you've got, if you've got the mind for it, um, this, this it's book. It's a deep book. This book is deep and it's very, it's very scary. Um, and I, you know, and I'm only up to. 100 page 100 no excuse me I take that back I'm up to page 123 right now and some of this stuff is like oh my god um, this 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 is some scary crap this is some real scary crap especially knowing friends what we've all learned about the Watchtown Bible Tract Society the mind control they use um, the phallic symbols we see in the subliminal images and how rigid they are holding on to a Judaistic myth like the blood doctrine. And don't forget, new light. New Gotta light. always have new light. Yeah. So take it for what it's worth. Um, we got it on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. It was like about 30 bucks or so, something like yeah. that. Kind of so. an expensive book, but yeah. uh, I, I think it's worth it. Well, it is. Um, there again, I got to ask the question what did a U.S. senator know about Charles Taze Russell and Rutherford? to say publicly that they were Freemasons and they were all part of this Zionist uh, movement here in the United States. Yep. So anyhow, well, anything else? that? Uh... <laughs> I think that's it. Um, thank you all for joining us for our happy hour. It's been great having you here so we can all visit. And <laughs> yes, yes. Not that we don't visit every time we do a video, but we really yes. like these happy hours because we can kind of just let things you know, kind of let things fly. <laughs> yeah. And I know several of you have sent messages to Skype with us and some who have given me your phone number to call you. I'm sorry. You know, I just haven't had time. And um, so we might be having an update on Real Rancho last night because uh, Tyler called us. And so mm. we might be having an update on that here real soon. Yeah. So. Yep. So I guess we'll see you next time around, and may all your glasses be filled, and drink them slowly. <laughs> you all have a wonderful evening. Bye. Bye.